And what I'd like to do is build on what Coco described of our research and then circle back to some of the points that, that Mary started because this session is all about uh, what are the human rights and equity uh, implications of climate change and of adaptation to climate change. So I want to make four points, uh, and I'll do it briefly, be, uh, just due to time constraints. So the first point is just to emphatically emphasize that from a care perspective, climate change is absolutely a social justice issue, and I, I think we need to, to see it through that lens and respond to it in that way. The second point I'd like to make is actually our research surfaced many examples of rights uh, issues and equity issues, and I'm going to highlight just four uh, of what I think are some of the key examples, and I'm going to focus on examples from the Asia region, just given that we're here in Bangladesh and we did the research in four Asian countries. Uh, then I want to talk just a little bit about how we're going to take the findings of that research and particularly the issues related to equity and rights and build those into the design of community-based adaptation projects that we're going to be, or that we're just starting now to implement in four of the eight countries where we did the research. And then I'll just end very briefly with a call to action which kind of comes back to to where Mary started. So just briefly, you know, on my first point, uh, when we say climate change is a social justice issue, uh, I think this audience knows very well that those least responsible for climate change are going to be certainly among those most affected. And so that's fundamentally, you know, an issue of, of social justice and, and climate justice. But, you know, one thing our research definitely shows is that even within uh, very vulnerable countries, uh, those who are excluded, uh, whether it be on the basis of their ethnicity, their religion, their caste, their gender, uh, are more vulnerable uh, than even their fellow citizens. And so I think that's, that the issue of social exclusion is something we really have to, to drill down on. Now, in terms of um, rights and equity issues surfaced by our research, I'll talk about four. The first of them is gender inequality. And uh, I'll start uh, on that topic by using what we found in our Bangladesh research, uh, where we did our research in the north of the country, in Kurigram district. And there we found that 97% of the out migrants from those villages were male which was a much higher percentage than in any of our other research countries. And we found that had two big gender implications. First of all, women and girls were left with a dramatically increased workload, you know, when uh, the male members of the household were away. Secondly, and this was more of a learning experience for me, uh, especially the young, younger women were subjected often to sexual harassment because again the male head of household was not there to, to protect them. So I think, you know, gender came out very strongly, um, you know, in our Bangladesh research. Another really important area, especially given our focus on food and livelihood security, was the issue of access to land and access to water resources. And again, uh, we found, you know, big issues in that regard. So if I could start with an example from India, where we did our research in Chhattisgarh state in uh, Janjgir district, uh, there we found that a very large percentage of the households in those communities where we did the research uh, basically are water insecure, both for drinking water and for agricultural purposes. And this despite the fact that those villages had access to canal irrigation. And the other thing that we found was that the competition for water and the pollution of the available water resources are both becoming much bigger issues because in that one district alone, more than 30 new coal-fired power plants are either under construction or permitted. And that, of course, has its own environmental you know, implications. 
Um, Vietnam, and Coco alluded to, to this fact, we found that landlessness was a major factor in terms of the vulnerability of households and whether and how they use migration. So 31% um, actually of the households in our research villages were landless, another 26% were, were land scarce. And so we found that these uh, households were more vulnerable and were more often having to migrate simply to, again, maintain uh, the status quo. We also found that those households, you know, were, you know, their prospects, if you will, um, are increasingly bleak because there's more and more consolidation of land ownership in that area and less and less demand for agricultural labor due to mechanization. So they're really caught in a bind. Um, the third rights issue I want to highlight is the issue of uh, the right to education. And again, uh, the India case study gave us a very dramatic um, documentation of that because unlike most of our research sites, households were moving as families uh, when they migrated seasonally. And they would often migrate for four to six months at a time. So you can imagine how the education of children uh, was disrupted, you know, by that uh, process. Also, interestingly, you know, we, when we did our research on migration, we, we inquired as to, you know, what was driving, you know, uh, migration decisions. And in India, only 2% of migration from these villages was for educational purposes. So mostly, again, people were migrating to survive, to feed their families, you know, after the, the harvest at the end of the monsoon season and uh, to get by until the, the next uh, season. And then the last issue I would highlight is just in general the issue of good governance. And again, we found many examples of of uh, let's just say failed governance or weak governance. And you know, India again provides us a good example because on the one hand, the Indian government has put in place very important national social safety net programs like the 100-day guaranteed employment scheme, uh, below poverty uh, line food rations, etc. But what we found in doing our research in these villages is that often the most vulnerable households were not actually getting access to their entitlements and that benefits were going to families that were better off. So fundamental issue of justice and, and, and governance. Um, very briefly, uh, just to talk about, uh, we're going to be implementing uh, community-based adaptation projects in Peru, Tanzania, uh, India, and Thailand. And we have very much taken some of these key findings related to rights and equity issues and built them into the design of the program. So all of them have a significant focus on women's empowerment. Most of them have a particular focus on, in the case of Thailand, for instance, ethnic minorities, in the case of India, scheduled tribes. So we're very much focusing on marginalized uh, populations uh, in that work. And then the, the third dimension is that we're very much focusing on this issue of access to resources and particularly access to water and uh, transparent and equitable governance of, of water resources. So just to conclude with a very brief call to action, I think, you know, from our perspective, the findings of this research really reinforce the need for urgent global action to address the, the climate crisis. Hundreds of uh, millions of people are already unable to realize basic human rights, such as the right to food or the right to development. And between now, you know, by 2050, we're talking about a population of nine billion people in the world. And we're talking about how do we feed, or how does the world feed nine billion people in a growing, you know, a growing population in a warming climate. And, you know, we feel very strongly that climate change is one of the biggest threats. It's already impacting the communities where we work. We've seen that. But we think it's a major threat in this century and for the next uh, generations to tackle if we're going to uh, eliminate hunger and poverty. Thank you. Thank you.